Okay, here we go. We are starting a Christmas series called The Carols of Christmas. We're going to walk through Christmas carols over the next couple weeks. As I looked at Christmas carols, one of the things I realized is that there are some weird ones. All right, let me give you an example. We wish you a Merry Christmas. Now, on the surface, you might think, we sing that every year. That's not a weird song. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We, oh, that, that was not good. That was not good. We're going to step that up a little bit. But, but here's the thing. We don't sing this. I didn't even know this existed. But if you look at the other verses of that song, here's what they say. Oh, bring us a figgy pudding. What in the world is a figgy pudding? I don't know, but it sounds gross. All right? I like fig newtons. I don't know if they're close, but it sounds gross. And the last line of verse says, and a cup of good cheer. Clearly, they're not Baptists. All right? All right? But then it says, we won't go until we get some. All right? Now, not only did these people singing this song have bad and weird taste, they also have bad manners. Because if anybody comes to my house demanding figgy pudding and not leave till they get some, they're going to be there a long time. There are some weird carols, but there are some rich and deep, true carols. And we only pull them out once a year with the rest of our decorations, and so we want to take some time to emphasize and look at these things. Songs that most of us in this room probably know by heart, even though we don't think about it. You've sung these songs your whole life. Even if you don't go to church, you know these songs. I was amazed when I watched the new Grinch movie. Who's seen the new Grinch movie? I mean, go to the theater, see the Grinch. It's good. But it was amazing in the Grinch that they sang a carol that mentioned Christ the Lord. Christ the Lord. We know these by heart, but maybe a lot of the lyrics have slipped by us without us thinking through them. So over the next four weeks, we're going to take a deeper look. And this week, it is Hark the Herald Angels Sing. The word hark is not a word we use very often, right? I just think of, think of some knights going, hark! You know, it's not a word we use. And, and so because of that, we don't really even know what it means, hark. But it means to stop and listen. It means to listen intently, listen closely. The writer of this carol is telling us to pay attention to something that he's afraid we will miss. You see, this is the most wonderful time of the year, but it is also the busiest and most stressful. And so we need to hark. We need to slow down, stop, and listen. We also need to bring the lights up a little bit in here so I can see your beautiful faces. Can we do that? Hey, that was awesome. We need to slow down and hark and listen. See, this time of year, everything and everyone around you is trying to tell you the true meaning of Christmas, right? Every, every Hallmark movie that you love so much, Right, tells you the true meaning of Christmas is love. The true meaning of Christmas is giving and not receiving. The true meaning of Christmas is family. The Grinch, the true meaning of Christmas is maybe it doesn't come from a store. No, maybe, just maybe it's a little bit more. And for retailers, the true meaning of Christmas is show someone you love them. By getting them this product that's only $1.99 while supplies last. You see, but the true meaning of Christmas has, has never been a secret. It's not something that's hidden. It's not something that's hard to explain or understand. And it was first announced 2,000 years ago in the middle of a field with no one else around except a few stinky shepherds. See, our carol is based on a text from Luke 2, 8 through 21. And so would you stand with me as we read the words of our God? Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 8, says, And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. 
For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was an There was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, They made known the saying that had been told them concerning the child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it has been told to them. And at the end of the eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. You see, our story begins with uh, just a few lowly shepherds hanging out in a field all by themselves. You see, earthly wisdom tells us that an announcement as big as the birth of the Savior of the world would be given to the most important, powerful people. Right? You would think that the angel would come to the kings of the day, the prophets of the day, the rich people of the day, the people that were the most networked, had the most influence. Right, so that they could use their wealth and influence and money to spread this message of the Savior coming. But the announcement doesn't go to anyone important. In fact, it goes to the complete opposite end of the spectrum. The announcement goes to shepherds. You see, shepherds had to be the least likely people on earth to receive an angelic announcement about the birth of a king. Because shepherds occupied the lowest class in Jewish society. They were the ultimate unskilled workers. It was literally a job for children. You raised up your children to be shepherds. If you were still a shepherd as an adult, you were basically a failure at life. They were viewed so low, remember this, they were viewed so low that they had no legal standing in court. They literally could not testify in court. Their word was not to be trusted. I didn't realize this growing up because in the children's plays at Christmas time at church or school, I always wanted to be in them, right? And, and you know, everybody wants to be Mary or Joseph, right? But that only one person can get those parts, right? And if you're a guy, you only got one shot at being one of those. And, and you know, but we would love to be baby Jesus, but that's either a fake doll or a baby. And if you're not a baby, you're, you're not going to get that. So that was really not an option. And so the second best option was either to be a wise man or a shepherd, Right? And, and, and being a shepherd was cool because you got this big, big fake beard that was awesome. And then you got this cool staff that before the show you could use it as a lightsaber right? and play around. Right? And so in my mind, shepherds were awesome. But see, being a shepherd in real life wasn't awesome. It was a hard life. It was lonely. You were looked down on, made fun of. It was dirty and it was unfulfilling and a disappointing life. And that's why it is so surprising that the angels go to shepherds. It's so surprising that the greatest news in the history of the world would go to mere shepherds. But not only is it surprising, but it is incredibly good news for you and me today. You see, because you and I are the shepherds in this story. While Christmas time is joyful and magical, It is also a reminder to us of just how broken life can be when we realize that we're more like the shepherds than maybe we first thought. You see, for some of you in this room, while everyone else has big plans and traditions and and they're on their Instagram and Snapchat and Twitter, I know some of you don't know what those is, but it's an internet thing, and they're posting pictures, right, And, and, and it's all over the place, and they got all these plans and do all these things, you are reminded you don't really have friends to go do things with, and your family is in disarray. And the magical time of the year ends up being for you a sad, lonely time. For some of you in this room, this time of year 
is a reminder that maybe this is the first Christmas that mom or dad is not here. Maybe this is the first Christmas where grandma or grandpa is no longer with us. Or maybe it's just this time of year and you remembered all those memories when mom and dad, grandma and grandpa were there. Or maybe a kid that is no longer with you. And this time is a sweet time, but it's also a bitter time because you are filled with all those memories of when they were there, but now they're not. And so you put on a smile, but inside you're broken and grieved. For some of you, you forget how dysfunctional your family is until Christmas comes around. And your goal over Christmas is just that no one would lose their temper, get in some big fight, walk out, leave mad, or the police don't get called. Some of you are so stressed out because you feel like you've got to do this big Christmas and you jack up your credit card, spend all this money. Some of you are stressed because... You're empty nesters now, and you don't know how to function with this man and this house without these kids. For all of the magic of Christmas, it can bring much stress, much depression, and much sadness. And these shepherds come into the very first Christmas not feeling like their lives were awesome. And maybe you feel the same. Maybe you just hide it and suppress it and keep Put the smile on because it's the most wonderful time of the year. And all the dysfunction and all the stress you bury down because you can't be sad at Christmas. But what I want you to see is it is you. You are the very person whom God is sending his angels to announce the greatest joy in the world. It is to people like you, broken and dysfunctional, that God sends his angel. You see, the world says, if you want to matter, if you want to be somebody, then you need power. You need influence. You need money. And if you have these things, then you'll be happy. If you scratch and claw your way to get to the top, to climb the ladder, then and only then will you be happy. The strong will survive and the weak will die. But Christianity has a vastly different message. The angel's message to these poor broken shepherds, in verse 10 says, And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. You want to know why this is good news? Who God is coming for, bringing everlasting joy to? It's not the powerful. It's not the, it's not the rich. It's not those with influence. It's not even the religious people who think they're holy and right. Jesus said it doesn't come for the well, but for the sick. This news God is coming for the broken, for the outcasts, for the poor, for the immoral, for the hurting, for the depressed, for the antisocial, the dysfunctional family, for the hurting and the hopeless. It is for dirty, lowly shepherds that God has come. Dirty, lowly shepherds like me and you. You see, if you feel like you don't deserve God's love, like you couldn't earn it, like it's too late for you, The message from the angels comes to you. It is good news of great joy for all people, especially the broken. There was a lady in New York City who worked in, you know, one of those big buildings, one of the big multi-billion dollar companies, and she made a mistake. And the mistake she made was not unnoticed by her bosses because it cost uh, the corporation a little good chunk of money. And all, all the big wigs went into this meeting to kind of talk about what happened and, and what are they going to do about their bottom line and with this issue. And, and she knew that she was going to lose her job because of the mistakes she made costing uh, the corporation some money. And when her boss came out of the meeting, he came up to her and he said, everything's okay, I've taken care of. And she stood there in kind of bewildered shock, like, what do you mean you took care of her? And, and, and he said to her, 
I knew they weren't going to fire me. I just took the blame and told them it was my fault. And then she was even more shocked because she, people in New York City and giant corporations do not stick their neck out for other people. That's, that doesn't happen. And so she's like, why in the world would you do this for me? I don't understand. No one does that for anybody. And he said, I just wanted to make sure you were okay. And he, and he wasn't trying to press it on her. And she kept pressing and kept pressing. And eventually he said, well, listen, I'm a Christian. And this is what we're all about. We're all about grace. Hark. Are you listening? Are you slowing down in this season to remember that it's not the most powerful, most famous, most put together people that God has come for. But it's for those who make mistakes. But it's for those who are broken. And it's for those who are dysfunctional. God has come for you. You see, first we see to whom uh, the message comes. But the next thing we're going to see is that there's a lot of celebration over this baby. We know about celebrating babies in the 21st century. Because we make a big fuss over babies now. There's the announcement picture, right? Got to stage it all up. We're pregnant. You know what I'm saying? Some of you in this room never did that. Some of us in this room have done that. And then there's the gender reveal picture and the gender reveal party and the gender reveal video. And then there's the arrival video. And you got to make sure you tell your family, we will be the first to post the picture of Precious. All right. And we make this big fuss over babies. We know that. We get that. But there has never been a bigger fuss made over a baby than this one. And this carol reflects that. And as we sing Hark the Herald, at the end of every verse, it says, Glory to the newborn king. But what's interesting, when this carol was written, this was not the line. It was not glory to the newborn king, Charles Wesley, in 1739 had a different tune that was slower, and it said glory to the king of kings. It was changed by George Whitfield later, but Wesley didn't like that. Wesley said it should be king of kings because there is nothing interesting, nothing special about a newborn king. Kings are born every day. Kings rise and kings fall. No one cares about a new king being born. They care that the king of kings has been born. You see, this is no ordinary king, but all other kings bow to him. Luke tells us that the angel said glory to God in the highest. It's a little lost on us because we're so familiar with this text that we may not have caught the highest part. We might just read over that. But he's saying the greatest glory, the highest glory is deserving to God for the birth of this baby. Which is really interesting coming from an angel, right? Because angels saw God do a lot of things, right? Angels saw God make water come from a rock in a desert, make manna, literally bread, fall from the sky, saw rain fire down and blow people up. The angels saw God create the world, galaxies upon galaxies. And yet they say that this is the highest glory. I want, I want to sit here for a minute because I want to try to get your mind wrapped around what the angels have seen versus the birth of Jesus and the difference. Astronomers tell us there, that there are around 3 million trillion stars. God spoke these stars into existence. Around 3 million trillion stars. I read that and I thought, and I was trying to think, what is a million trillion? Is that even a number? And I tried to... to to think through how to think about that number and the decimal places and the commas and the zeros, and I couldn't even, like, I don't, so I had to, had to text my brother-in-law, who is a math, a master in math from the North Carolina University. I texted him, I said, hey man, is this a real number? And he said, well, technically, yes, but really it should be called a quintillion. Oh, okay, Thanks. So whatever word you use, there are either three million trillion stars or three quintillion stars. But it's a three with 24 zeros after it. Okay? A lot of stars. 
when you start talking about numbers this big, it, it really doesn't mean anything to us, right? It's like, oh, that's a, bit, that's a lot, right? So I want to I wanna help you understand this. One million seconds ago, one million seconds ago was about a week and four days ago. You were getting ready to travel for Thanksgiving. A week and four days ago. A million seconds. One billion seconds ago was March 24th, 1987. I wasn't born. All right? I was almost born, but not quite. One trillion seconds ago was 31,688 years ago. A trillion seconds. A million seconds is only 11 days ago, but a trillion seconds is almost 32,000 years ago. And the universe has three million trillion stars, and our star is only one of those stars, and it's actually on the small side. And our little sun puts out the amount of energy of a trillion megaton bombs, which is enough energy to produce civiliza our civilization for 500,000 years every single second. These angels were there when God said, let there be light, and all of that happened. That many stars, that many suns, that many galaxies in an instant. And yet, the angels saw all of that and said, but this baby surpasses it all. Surpasses every bit of it. The highest glory because of this baby being born. The song says, veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity, pleased as man with men to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. The greatest glory that God has ever displayed was in a decision to veil and come his glory down into a little baby. But why is this birth such a big deal? First Peter tells us that the angels long to glare into and look into the gospel. That they don't even quite understand it, and so they long to look deeper and deeper and deeper into the gospel. It is what this baby has come to do that has so amazed the angels to celebrate like this. In 2009, you might remember the case of Bo Bergadell. Bo Bergadell served in the army, and in 2009, he abandoned his post. And he was a traitor to our country. In 2009, after Bo Bergerdell was a traitor to our country and abandoned his post, he was captured by the Taliban, a terrorist, and was a prisoner of theirs for five years. And this sparked great controversy, right? Do we try to release, secure his release? Do we try to get him out of jail, away from the Taliban? I mean, he is an American, but he is a deserter. Do we try to do that or not? And there was great debate on the, get on the news, and everybody's arguing about it. What should we do? And it sparked even more controversy when the president released five al-Qaeda terrorists to secure the release of the traitor Bo Bergerdell. People were saying things like, these guys are just going to turn around, become terrorists again, kill more innocent Americans, and then we will have traded the innocent, good American lives for this traitor Bo Bergerdell. I can't say whether or not we should have done that. But what I can say is that God looked at us and knew we were traitors. We were enemies and rebels against his kingdom. And he did not trade traitors for, or rebels or terrorists for us. No, he traded the life of his own son for traitors like you and me. Veiled in flesh the Godhead see. Hail the incarnate deity, pleased as man with men to dwell. Jesus, our Emmanuel, deserves the highest glory. When we were traitors to the kingdom of God, the Bible says we were children of wrath, and yet God came for us. And yet he came. He didn't send some servant. He didn't send some hired hand. He didn't just throw some money at it to make the problem go away. He himself came. When you doubt your value, remember that. God came for traitors like you and I. You see, it's so easy for us in this room to think that we are good, moral people who just have a few blind spots here or there. Just make a few mistakes here or there. But that's not who we are. You and I are rebels against the kingdom of God. Traitors to the throne serving our own agendas and our own desires 
and rebelling against God. And so the angels were amazed. It's one thing to create a world through, the, through your words, but it's another to give your life and save your enemies. The angels were amazed at God's love and grace to save traitorous sinners like you and me. And so the carol sings, God and sinners reconciled, who were once enemies but are now family. My favorite words in the whole song are, born that man no more may die, born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. See, this is the gospel. This is the good news that the angels came to share with the exact people who needed to hear it the most. You look at your life now and you see the dysfunction. You see the disappointments. You see the self-pity. And you feel like often that you've got to keep proving your worth. You've got to make up for the wrong that you've done. You've got to, you've got to pull yourself up by your bootstraps and be a good person again. And as New Year's comes around, you're going to make all of these promises to yourself that you're not going to keep. You don't have to because God has already kept them for you. You can stop trying so hard to be so perfect to earn his love because he's earned it for you. God has come to give you new life so that you may never die. And the life that he's come to give you can only be described as new birth. Because it's a completely new life. Full of joy. I love the way C.S. Lewis says it, of course. He says, the son of God became a man so that men could become sons of God. The Son of God became a man so that men could become sons of God. God came to do that for traitors. You see, many of you in in this room feel like shepherds. You feel unwanted, unloved. You feel undeserving. You feel broken, unredeemable, and unforgivable. But the angel told the shepherds to go and see for themselves. Go see the newborn baby. And so the shepherds, they traveled to Bethlehem and saw that what the angel said was true, that here was this baby wrapped in swaddling clothes in a manger in a barn with a bunch of animals. That God really had come. That God had come to be their savior, to save the whole world, to save all people, even shepherds like them. He had come not just to be born, but to grow up and to give his life for the very shepherds that stood over his little cradle. See, the shepherds stood there. Beholding the one who valued them when no one else did. Who valued them so much, he announced his arrival to them alone and gave his life for them. Now, does that sound like the kind of God who will give up on you when times get hard? Does that sound like the the type of God who quits on you when you fail? Does that sound like the type of God who is constantly angry and wagging wagging his finger at you? Or does it sound like the kind of God who loves you more than you possibly deserve or could possibly fathom? Don't doubt his love for you. Instead, let it transform you. And think about this. The only ones who got to hear this announcement from the angels were the shepherds. Everyone else heard the announcement from the shepherds. The shepherds get glory and angels, and everyone else gets stinky, dirty shepherds. But that is exactly how God spreads his gospel. Not through people who have their act together, not through people who are cleaned and buttoned up, not through people who are pretty and wealthy, but through people who are dysfunctional, broken, and hurt, and messes. Throughout the Bible, God is using broken people to spread his message. And so God gave his, listen to this. I told you at the beginning to remember. God gave his message to the shepherds whose testimony wouldn't count, who were not to be trusted. He gave the most important message in the world to them to testify and share. God isn't looking for someone else to share his message. He's looking for you. So look, listen, get this one thing. 
you are not a good person. You like to think you are, but you're not. You are a traitor and an enemy of God. And until you bow your knees to the little baby who would grow up to lay down his life for you, until you surrender to him, you will remain an enemy and a traitor of God. But once you do, he doesn't keep beating you down and suppressing you and making you live better, trying to fix this or fix that, earn your keep. But rather, he lifts your chin and eye and he says, you are mine. I love you. You don't have to live in fear anymore. You are valued. Your dignity and worth matter. In a season and a time where stress and anxiety and family gets us down, remember that God came for people like you. And not just people like you, but he came for you in all of your mess. And he loves you with no strings attached. And he wants to transform your life and trans- use you to transform the world. The question is, will you let him? You see, though the world would never understand, maybe it is actually better to be a shepherd after all. There may be some of you in this room, and you are only in this room this morning because your mom or dad or grandma or friend dragged you because it's Christmas time and you've got to be here. But I believe God has you here for a reason. If you don't know this Jesus, this is not just some religious scam. I don't want to offer you religion. Religion doesn't do anything for anybody. I want to offer you life. It only comes through Jesus. If you're here this morning and you are stressed about the family that's coming in town or that you're going to and you're stressed about how much money you've got to spend and, and you already can feel, you can already hear the drama coming, slow down and hark and listen to the voice of God. That Christmas isn't about getting the turkey right, the ham right, or the best present. It's not about having the perfect Instagram picture. It's about Jesus, and we need to stop being so busy and listen to him, because we might be shepherds out in the field dysfunctional, but he sends the greatest announcement in the world to us, people like us, and if you'll listen to him, you'll get the best Christmas present in the world, it's Christ the King, let's pray. Father, we come to you. This morning, and we pray just in this time, God, if there is anyone in this room who, man, they've heard these things. They've heard Christmas stuff before. But God, deep down, they know that they know that they're not yours, that if they were to die now, they'd bust hell wide open, that their life is miserable. And they try everything else to bring satisfaction to it. If I could just get this or that, then I'd be happy. If I could just have this family or that money or that job, then I'd be happy. God, would you show them this morning that you are the only thing that can satisfy the deepest parts of their heart? Would you show them that they are truly shepherds, but it is for shepherds that you came. It is for broken people that you came to pick them up and to make them new. God, this morning, would you invite them? Would you bring them down? And would you save them, make them new? Oh, God, this morning, we need you. Wherever you're at this morning, the deacons and I will be at the front. We would love to pray with you. We would love to just to hear your story. We'd love to just hug your neck. If you'd like to come and just pray at these steps, maybe for a family, maybe for the season, maybe for whatever you need, we'll be here. You're welcome to come and pray. In Jesus' name we pray. God, we need you. Amen. Stand and sing with us. Thank you.
So one, uh, just like we had our, our Thanksgiving photo booth, we have a Christmas photo booth, and so may not all be dressed right today, but just know back here, we want to give you an opportunity to take your family pictures for Christmas back there. Second, if you're our guest this morning, we're just so honored that you chose uh, to be here. Uh, we have a gift for you. We'd love to give you straight to the center doors on the left. 
uh, and I would love to meet you. So please come introduce yourself to me. I'll be standing right back there. We'd love to just hear your name and uh, get to know you just for a moment. I uh, hope you guys have a good day. Peace be with you.